Welcome to the very best part of my broadcast week. Those of you who love this show, and there are many across the country and the world for that matter, know I care about one issue right now more than any other. What happened in the 2020 presidential election, and more importantly, what did not happen in the 2020 election, and how confusion and bitterness about that set of facts continues to haunt our politics and jeopardize the future of this great, grand, and glorious constitutional republic, an experiment handed down to us by the Founding Fathers. So we're gonna continue that conversation today. My special guest is Ken Block. He has a book, and I wanna read you the full title and subtitle. It's one of the longest <laughs> subtitles I've ever encountered in American publishing history. The title, one word, Disproven. The subtitle, Listen Carefully, My Unbiased Search for Voter Fraud for the Trump Campaign, the data that shows why he lost and how we can improve our elections. Ken Block, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Unbiased. You know that is in itself a volatile word in our current political atmosphere, though it undoubtedly. ought not to be. Undoubtedly. Tell, me, tell my audience why you can so confidently assert that your perspective on this central question is unbiased. Yeah. So I'm a data analyst. I'm a relational database expert. Uh, I came into this entire agreement with the Trump campaign, which fell out of the sky, literally. Just to be clear, you yeah. worked for the Trump campaign. After the election. Yeah, I, I got the phone call the day, two days after the election, uh, asking me to look for voter fraud uh, for the Trump campaign. The lawyer who reached out to me was a, a, a guy named Alex Cannon. And uh, as we negotiated sort of the rules of engagement for what I would do and how I would do it, uh, I wanted to make very clear that I wasn't promising a specific result, that in a decade of looking at voter data across the country. I'd never encountered anything close to what I knew the Trump campaign needed me to find. And I wanted to make sure he understood I wasn't promising a result and that I wouldn't accept any special requests for a specific finding. I was supposed to deliver findings that could inform lawsuits and that would stand up in court. That's the biggest phrase, stand up in court. And uh, Alex, to his great credit, told me that he wanted the kind of look that I was going to do. He didn't want a custom order set of results because his professional reputation, I'm surmising, was gonna be on the line. Uh, as well as it, yours. As well as mine, and he understood. He said that was the approach that he wanted. And with that, off I went. And the probably the, without doubt, the craziest 35 days of my life. Mm -hmm. And when you began this work, did you have a hunch one way or the other? Well, I told him I didn't expect that we would be able to deliver the results he was looking for. Just based meaning on sufficient to sufficient overturn to overturn the to, to overturn. And tell my audience why, based on that ten years of experience you refer to, you didn't expect to find either mismanagement or fraud or something legally actionable that could overturn the result of ten thousand, twenty thousand votes. Yeah. So I've looked uh, in depth at duplicate votes and deceased voters uh, in about 42 states across the country over the years. And I found the, the largest body of duplicate vote fraud that I found was attached to the 2016 election, where I found about 8,500 votes that I could confirm were individuals who took two bites at the apple. But that was across 35 different states. Uh, Again, and, not sufficient in magnitude not to alter the in results right. in any way. Right, right. Um, and the whole narrative itself, that when people talk about voter fraud, especially when conservatives talk about voter fraud, it's attached to, and Democrats do it all the time. And what I found looking at voter fraud in the 2016 election was that Republicans committed the duplicate vote crime just as often as Democrats did. There wasn't a partisan bias to the whole thing. And that's a really important point, Ken. I'm glad you raised that because there is this assumption that if there's X number of votes that someone questions, all of them went in one direction. Right. 
And that would therefore catapult, in this case, former President Trump back into office. Your experience, the real live evidence is, no, those are probably, if they are questionable votes, which is a huge legal hurdle in the first place, but even if they are, they're probably going to cut in ways that are relatively similar to the way all the other votes cut. Sure, but what you're touching on right now needs further explanation. Please, please. Because Let's imagine, now I did not find this, I'm creating a, 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 an imaginary scenario. Okay, did not uh, find this I imaginary did not find scenario. It. It's, it's actually, and it has to be, I have to be very careful to yes. be very clear yes. and when I talk about Please. this, because I can be taken out of context mm -hmm. very readily. So let's imagine that I found 15,000 fraudulent votes cast in Georgia in 2020, and the, the margin of victory just to be, is call it 12,000. 12,000, So let's imagine right. I found 15,000. Let's imagine, imagine, it's, it's imagine. It's imaginary. Uh, <laughs> Even had I found it, the Trump campaign could never prove the harm necessary to prove in court that those fraudulent votes worked against the campaign. And so that's a, that's a remarkable thing that many people lose track of. It's one thing to find the votes. It's quite another thing to show the harm and that those votes all went against Trump. You can't possibly do that because when we vote in this country... Thank you so much. Oh, perfect. Thank Ken's, you. I have, uh, no idea how I'm gonna, I have no idea how I'm going to do this. In between in, breaks. In, in, in between, between breaks. During the breaks, so, you're going to do it, Ken. Um, <laughs> Any I, day now is our restaurant, I, by the I way. I actually brought a lobster bit. I bought two. So if you were going to eat, you know, we could maybe set ourselves up. But <laughs> We'll get uh, we'll, to the Rhode we'll Island angle yeah. in a second. <laughs> so, so you can't show the harm because we vote anonymously when we vote. You can't trace the votes back to figure. So if I found 15,000 votes ca cast by registered voters for some reason let's say they were all deceased votes mm -hmm. you still don't know how those votes were cast you can't show the harm i can't imagine a legal scenario where a judge would overturn or uh either cancel the election or overturn it without being able to fundamentally prove that those votes went against the trump campaign it can't be done so all of these court cases i think would have failed even had all the fraud been found we'll get to some of the specifics in a minute but when you reported back the evidence you found, did you encounter angry reactions from Alex or anyone in the no. Trump campaign? So uh, Alex was terrific to work with because uh, not only did he understand the framing in which I was willing to do the work, he told me that he would keep me shielded from all the political pressures that were coming down on him from above. So the White House didn't know that uh, my company specifically was doing the work. So then I couldn't have the political pressures brought upon me which made my work far easier to do because I wasn't, fed, I, was, I didn't need to fend off pressure from anywhere mm -hmm. else. Alex was taking care of that. And uh, Alex accepted my findings. The other lawyers that he worked with accepted my findings. He told the January 6th committee that he took my findings to uh, Mark Meadows, Trump's chief of staff at the time. Mark Meadows' uh, response to Alex, as he stated to the January 6th committee, and this made the, te the televised hearings. Yes. Uh, Mark Meadows' response to hearing that not only could the campaign not find fraud, but all of the claims that were brought to the campaign's attention were also disproven. And Meadows' response to that was, that means there's no there there when he's talking about uh, the claims of voter fraud. And then uh, at the end of 2023, there were news reports that uh, Meadows, in his communications with Jack Smith's investigators, told them that he brought the findings of no fraud into the Oval Office. Where they did encounter hostility from the former you president. You would assume that they did, yes. Based on the rhetoric that followed. Our guest is Ken Block. The book, again, Disproven with the longest subtitle in the history of American publishing, but it's an important one. I will read it again. My unbiased search for voter fraud, voter fraud for the Trump campaign, the data that show why he lost and how we can improve our election. Segment two of the takeout coming your way in just one second. This is about facts, facts, facts. And I can back these facts up with anybody who wants to come at me. Welcome back to The Takeout. As I mentioned in the first segment, any day now is our restaurant. And when I say host restaurant, just for clarification, they don't buy our food. We pay for our food. They just make room for us because we kind of roll slightly large and restaurants need 
to accommodate their customers, and we're happy when they accommodate us. Any day now, thanks so much for hosting. Ken Block is our guest. Disproven is the book. I won't read the subtitle again, but we'll get back to that in a second. <laughs> I want to know, Ken, what has the reaction been to your book? Because you know and I know that there's a wide swath of Americans who don't need to read this book, who don't believe the 2020 election was stolen, but you and I both want to reach the people who believe it was. Yeah. We want... We don't want to lecture them. I don't want to call them names. I want to bring them back into the American conversation in a way that they feel comfortable and we can agree on some basic, right. discoverable, verifiable facts. You know the part of America I'm talking about. I do. What's the reaction been? So, muted okay. is, is the, be the best way that I could uh, frame it so far. It's actually been very frustrating as we uh, put together the book tour and we're reaching out to media across the spectrum. Uh, there's really been crickets from conservative media about covering anything to do with my story going back a year ago when the Washington Post broke the story that I was served a subpoena by Jack Smith. Right. So uh, the only coverage I've had in conservative media in over a year was a Washington Examiner story about summertime last year just mentioning the fact that I had received a subpoena. And then I gave an hour-long interview to the Epic Times about three weeks ago, four weeks ago. And the framing of the, the reason that they reached out to me was uh, uh, the Homeland Group, I think, and Rasmussen had produced a poll about massive uh, mail ballot fraud. And the, oh, right. the poll itself was wholly yes. just done completely wrong, and it holds no water at all. And uh, so we started talking about that, and I quickly put to bed... The, the whole poll because it just it wasn't had it didn't, no foundation in science no foundation in fact uh, and then we just talked about the book a little bit and and the only quotes that I gave him that made the story but they were important quotes I said I was hired by the Trump campaign to find evidence of fraud to change an election result and most importantly would stand up in court and it utterly wasn't there we were not able to find anything that met those criteria and that's just a, a plain, cold fact. And he printed that verbatim mm. as I gave it to him. And for conservatives to hopefully have read that and absorbed it, I think, is the important thing. I, I took as even a tone as I could as I wrote this book. You did. This is not about it's not a bashing anybody, and it's not about throwing roses at anybody, right? Nope. This is about facts, facts, facts. And I can back these facts up with anybody who wants to come at me and challenge what I did, what my agenda might have been. Mm -hmm. you know, there was none. This was about doing the job that the campaign needed me to do so that if I had found fraud sufficient to change an election result, I could have gone to court, made it stand up, and given the campaign the chance to make their case and be successful. And the, the challenge was there just wasn't the fraud available to get to that point. Mm -hmm. And I hope you take this as a compliment. The book is a bit dry. Meaning it's not, it's not passionate in the sense of you're trying to use loaded language Correct. to make your point. Correct. You're not trying to lead the witness, yep. as it were. And I find that a very great strength of the book. Um, talk to me about things that you talk about in the book that people who have questions about the 2020 election still cling to like double counting, double voting, or deaths. People who are on the rolls, dead people voting. Yeah, let's talk about deceased voters. Uh, because that's one of the, I'm going to use the word easier, but it's simply because it lacks the complexity of duplicate votes where you have to deal with voter registrations from multiple different states. So for the deceased voters... The campaign handed me every mail ballot record cast in the swing states. And we all know the states by yes. heart. Yes. Georgia, Arizona, Nevada, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Okay. Yep. Uh, there were 21 million mail ballot votes that I, I think that's a number, that I, that I looked at. It, might have, it could have been registrations, mail ballot. I'm not sure which one it was. But we looked at 21 million records, and we looked at all of them to determine if they were alive or dead. And when we applied whether they were alive or dead to the actual ballots cast, we found singleton numbers of deceased votes that were cast. 
less than 10 in right. virtually every single swing state. Now, even if we found 100, it's still nowhere close to what it needed to be. Right. And, and what's interesting, and I think it's, it's, it's worth pointing out, I really know what I'm doing when it comes to this particular evaluation. Uh, I had taken a look at Pennsylvania's voter registration, uh, the full voter rolls, in September of 2020. And I found a couple of registrants who had died in five, six, seven, eight years ago, but they had been registered to vote in September of 2020. And I looked at those and I said, you watch, these are incipient voter fraud that's coming, right? right. You're going to watch this. And it happened. And what's interesting is that finding was entered into a, as evidence in a court case that was uh, being run in October of that year. So it's on the record. It's mm -hmm. right there. Election officials knew about these uh, potentially fraudulent votes that, and deceased registrants, did nothing to stop it. The votes were cast. The votes were counted. And then after the election, the voter was removed from the rolls as being deceased, and the people responsible for casting those ballots were arrested and convicted. So it's, it's kind of remarkable right. that it happened, and it, it happened easily, right? Mm -hmm. So... Uh, but that doesn't mean it's happening everywhere right. because there are substantial penalties attached to doing it. And for everyone out there who's thinking, well, if it was so easy to do, I'm going to do it, I can catch you. Yep. You can be caught. Yeah. And it's a prosecutable crime. Uh, five years in jail and $10,000 fine at the top end. Talk to me about something else that is becoming topical and will probably become more topical. Non-citizen voting. Yeah. Please. So... Several times I've been asked about non-citizen voting uh, over the years. In fact, uh, Vice President Pence's office mm -hmm. had me in to the uh, old executive office's building for a day, and I spoke to Pence's staff uh, about the issue. And the challenge for everybody in talking about whether non-citizens are voting or not is there is no database anywhere that you can look at that gives you a list of everybody who is either a citizen or is not a citizen. In fact, the only database that I'm aware of at all cannot be used for this purpose, and that's the Department of Homeland Security's database, which is by federal law sealed off from any kind of access for like, privacy like, reasons. Like, like, like we're talking about. So uh, with that huge caveat in mind, and I, what I just told you, I told Alex Cannon repeatedly as we were talking about, and specifically Arizona non-citizen voting, mm -hmm. Uh, and I said, the, you know, the closest we can get is using uh, credit bureau information where credit bureaus have access to social security numbers and that sort of thing. And we can try to identify registered voters who don't have social security numbers at the, at the credit bureaus or don't even exist in the credit bureaus as maybe some indicator. But right. it's not you can't take that to the bank because many students don't show up in the credit bureaus, people right. who... Uh, don't own homes and you know, don't have cell phones. There's, there's a thousand reasons why the credit bureaus don't know somebody. And I said, you know, and the worst problem really is young people who don't show up. And just because they don't show up doesn't mean they're not a citizen. In fact, they very likely are. Mm -hmm. I was given a, a file of, I think, 1,500 or 2,500 uh, potential non-citizen votes that were cast in Arizona. And the names weren't what you would think. There were as many McGregors as there were Rodriguez's, right? I mean, it was really, I don't know who came up with the list. It was kind of an extraordinary list. Mm -hmm. uh, and we ran it, even with all the caveats. And what came back was most of the, we, about a thousand of the records we found in the credit bureaus and they, everything looked good. For everybody else, the majority of the ones we couldn't find were young. Young. And, and I said, that's game over right there. You just, you can't go to court with something as muddled as the results that we're seeing here. Uh, you can't say with any certainty that any of the people that didn't get a hit are not citizens. Right. And it took, it took that to put the thing to bed, and we did. It's a very unsatisfying answer. Wouldn't it be great to be able to say with mm -hmm. some certainty it's happening or it's not happening? And in that particular case, I don't think anybody can. And the claims that it's happening in massive scale can't be proven or disproven. That is the voice of Ken Block. Segment three of The Takeout coming your way in just one second. A lot of the fraud claims that came to me working for the front Trump campaign were by people who didn't even understand how the mail ballot process worked.
Welcome back to The Takeout, our host restaurant any day now. I think about that in this context. Get over the 2020 election any day now, please. I'm begging you. Ken Block is our special guest. The book Disproven. Subtitle, My Unbiased Search for Voter Fraud for the Trump Campaign. The data that shows why he lost and how we can improve our elections. By the way, I would gladly take any suggestions on how I could possibly <laughs> shorten that up. But... No need to. No need to. I want to read it in full. Uh, back to non-citizens. It is against federal law to vote as a non-citizen. And the if you vote in person, you have to show some verification of your registration status. And most people who are non-citizens would be intimidated by that. They wouldn't go in because they could be subject to discovery, which is one of the reasons that the data and the surveys suggest that this is not nearly the problem it is described to be. Yeah, if somebody is here in violation of the law, are they going to stick their neck out and expose themselves to trouble when they need or want to be here because they're working or whatever the situation is, uh, to really get involved in our electoral process seems like an unnecessary risk, and I think people, by and large, are risk-averse. So uh, it, it's hard. It's hard to imagine that it's happening at scale. Uh, I think there's other more plausible ways that someone could take advantage of uh, uh, of weaknesses in our electoral system, other than this one. Now, again, not that it's happening. I'm just saying, if, mm -hmm. you know, if I was gonna, if I was gonna, you know, script something for for somebody, there's other ways that you would do it. Another assertion: mail-in balloting is a pathway. The former president suggests it's a highway to voter fraud, is it? It can be. I don't believe that it is, uh, because to cast, let's say in the case of Georgia, 12,000 fraudulent illegal mail ballots uh, is difficult. And I want to describe the process because the process of casting a mail ballot is pretty complicated and you would need an army of people doing it. So what, the way it would work or the way it works, when you cast a, mail, a vote by mail, maybe a lot of people haven't, you have to fill in a form requesting a mail ballot. Right. You send it in, uh, election workers confirm that you are who you, you have a, a valid record and that everything works, matches in terms of your date of birth, your address and everything else. Only if all that works, they will then mail you an actual ballot, right? Many people don't understand it's a two-step process. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the fraud claims that came to me working for the Trump campaign were by people who didn't even understand how the mail ballot process worked. Right. So the ballot, actual ballot is mailed out. You have to cast your vote on the ballot. You have to fill out an inner envelope with, and this varies by state by state by state. It gets very complicated at this point. Some states require you to put your date of birth, your address and other things. Some states require you to provide additional documentation right. along with it. The, the unevenness in how we handle things like this, as a computer guy, drives me crazy. It's not right. right that we can't do it all the same way in every state, and I think we should, back part of the book. Right. Um, and once it's all filled out, the outer envelope, the inner envelope is sealed. You put it in the outer envelope, which is for mailing. You send it in. Again, election workers are going to confirm, match your signature potentially, which is a terrible way to confirm identity. And only then does the vote count. So you can see with all these steps and the checks that are in, in the middle, it would, it's certainly possible, but to do thousands this way, I think would be extraordinarily difficult. Some in my audience would be saying, wait a minute, some states, don't they send them to everyone? There are some states that do their elections wholly on mail ballot. Uh, I believe it, uh, Oregon. Oregon is doing it, right? Yep. I think uh, Colorado, Colorado does right, it. right. Yep. So Washington um, State, I believe, now, also. As a candidate, you were right? once a candidate. I, I yes. was a candidate. That's the Rhode Island so, reference it, and the lobster bib thing. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I ran for governor in Rhode Island twice, and uh, at part of the campaign is you architect your final message, right? So right. You, the grand finale to a year and a half of campaigning is what you're going to tell your voters in the really ideally the last week of the election because so many people don't pay attention up until that point in time with early voting in some case the early voting window could be multiple weeks mm -hmm. you have a challenge and a problem with a campaign because if you bring out your final message right. too early the vote a lot of voters that you need to reach aren't even going to receive that message right right and you have a limited budget most people have a limited budget in terms of media and everything else so it's it's a hard thing and i know we shouldn't craft our election 
uh, regulations keeping candidates in mind. Right. But, you know, it can be a challenge. And in a presidential election with the different windows all over the country, I can't even imagine the headache involved in trying to figure out your messaging strategy with the, the windows all over the place. So I'm a big fan of standardization. I think that we need more federal guidance on how elections should be work, uh, how they should work, and that all the states have to adhere to common sense ones. And my suggestions that I come up with are nonpartisan. I'm not trying to convey any kind of uh, advantage to one partisan or another. Mm -hmm. These are just things I think we need to do to get better elections. Talk to me about another thing that often crops up in this conversation with lots of confusion around it, ballot harvesting. Yeah, I hate it. So uh, what ballot harvesting is, so first of all, it's legal in about 25 states. So right. when, everybody talk, when anybody talks about ballot harvesting and then either infers or outright says it's illegal, well, it's not. I think it should be, okay? And here's why. Because, and again, I'm going to fall back to my Rhode Island experience. So Rhode Island has very strict laws that says candidates and their campaign staff and their volunteers on election day can't stand within 100 feet of the entrance of a polling place. Makes sense. Right. Voters shouldn't have to run a gauntlet of electioneering to, 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 to get in there. In Rhode Island, because ballot harvesting is legal and candidates themselves can actually harvest the ballots, a candidate or that candidate's staff or volunteers can literally look over the shoulder of a voter at their kitchen table while they cast their vote. And the dissonance for me is how can you care so much about the in-person voting and the and the privacy and, there and, and, and the privacy there and not not have it there. But right. wor the worst problem with, with ballot harvesting is should our elections be determined by whichever campaign apparatus can collect the most votes? Mm -hmm. I am a guy who thinks that you win your votes on the merits, which I know is kind of quaint and probably why I lost. Uh, <laughs> and it's a uh, I don't think that we should our elections should be determined by aggressive ballot collection and returning. I think that voters, in most scenarios, can cast their ballots. In those scenarios where they can't, nursing homes and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. Right. I think caregivers, specifically with a job, should be empowered to collect the ballots on the behalf of the people they care for. And if you're being home cared for, it can be a close family member. Right. So we don't want to make it hard for You would not classify that as harvesting. No, right, right. I mean, well, some people do. Right. And, and, but I think that you but need But that would to, be in a different category, that, yeah, functionally and, and, and legally. Right. It so ought to be. We want to empower people right. to vote, but I think we want to stop the practice of collect, aggressively collecting and turning in ballots. How about drop boxes? Do you find anything baseline fraudulent about drop boxes? I think that they do represent a bit of a security problem where, you know, you have an unmonitored drop box. Who knows how ballots get in there? Uh, I think if you have video surveillance of the boxes, I think that you can solve a Which lot of those. Which most jurisdictions yeah, I think do. you can solve a lot of those problems. Vast majority um, of jurisdictions yeah. do have video. I mean, you know, in, in 2020, I uh, voted by mail and I dropped, well, I, I got a mail ballot and I dropped it in a drop box. And let me push back a little bit on that because... I think of a drop box as more secure than the postal delivery because fewer people it's, touch it. It's more certain. The drop box is a drop box. Yeah. It's a central place that has video surveillance, and it is the one and only place. And they're picked from there, and they take into a vote counting area. Yeah. Through the mail, uh, uh, there's a truck, there's a person, there's a bag carrier, there's a processing facility, and then there's another delivery mechanism on the other side. Yeah. So when I just think about the number of hands or machines touching it, I actually think drop boxes have some security benefits. Yeah, I think the, the big... Do you disagree with I'm that? Put, I'm putting myself into, into a conservative mindset. Mm -hmm. I think the real concern ultimately is just stuffing thousands of ballots into a box. And, 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 and this is important. The 2,000 mules, I hear it over and over oh, again. Oh my gosh, mules, yes. I, I, uh, Dinesh and I were on campus together at the same time for a couple of years. So Dinesh uh, Souza. Yeah. Um, there is, and this is, it's been thoroughly debunked over and over again. Not that people care who, who believe, um, hold that it, thought. Cause I got to go to break, okay. but it's an important thought. I don't yeah. want to, I don't want to jump in. Ken block is our special guest. That thought on 2000 mules and the fraudulency behind it. When we come back segment for the take on one second. So my ballot was mailed in. I died before election day. Does my vote count or does my vote not count?
Welcome back to The Takeout, our breakfast conversation. Any day now, our host restaurant, Ken Block, is our guest. Ken, you were talking about 2,000 Mules, which is a pseudo-documentary. It advertises itself as, and I can say that with confidence because recently, when the lawyers representing the producers of that film were asked, it was kind of a demand by Georgia investigators for the evidence underlying their assertions, they filed papers in court to say they have no evidence to back up their assertions. So not my words. Those are their words. Right. Ken Block, continue. Yeah. This idea of lying and impugning elections as a potent political weapon, right? And uh, fundraising a, tool. A rallying cry for, for your hardest core supporters, fundraising, as you say. Cottage industry, uh, basically. There is a distinct problem of using it in that way, but then crossing over into the legal realm where there are consequences for lying. And, you know, we watched Rudy Giuliani. It's maybe the, the most extreme case of his admitted lies about Ruby Freeman and what it has now cost him financially because the election of the, worker the, because in Fulton of, County, Georgia, yeah, because yeah. of the defamation suit Moss. that yep. he lost. Uh, Carrie Lake is facing a defamation suit for her attacks on a uh, election worker in, in Phoenix. Uh, and it, we're seeing with 2000 mules, not that they're, this is more of, a, I think, a, an information gathering, legal gathering exercise, but it all has to be done under sworn testimony, and the lawyers involved can't lie about it, or they right. shouldn't lie about it. Right. And they didn't, and they said, we don't have any of the evidence to Facing back it up. sanction, they admitted they had no evidence. Yeah. And I guess that's the most remarkable thing about the narrative of voter fraud, mostly for me, is that real fraud, the fraud that is detectable, quantifiable, and verifiable, the right. stuff I work on, right. I could prove it wasn't there. The other claims of fraud, then the claims that weren't brought to my attention, right? The hearsay claims. I saw a, 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 a mountain of ballots in a ditch. I saw a, right. a box truck full of ballots, right? Uh, the guy in Arizona who's talking about bamboo shoots in the yes, paper, right? I mean, you can yes. go on and on and on All the bamboo about, shoots. about the hearsay nature of this. And hearsay evidence is not legally acceptable evidence in any court of law in our country. And the ninjas did it, and they didn't find it anyway. Correct. In Arizona. Just remember right. that, folks. I'm telling you, the story keeps changing, but the facts about the 2020 election don't. The data doesn't move. The hysterical, propagandistic, deceptive stories keep changing. That ball keeps moving, and it moves for a reason. The goalposts move, uh, and, and it's frustrating. And you should be, I beg of you, think about that. Why does the story keep changing? Because it has the, to. It has to. It has to. I want to get to the back half of the book. I Thank promise you, you that. You. How can we make elections? First of all, we should understand, ladies and gentlemen, I've talked about this before, are decentralized. It's one of the things that we love about our country. We decentralize Think We love local control, state management. It's in the Constitution, time, manner, and place. You wish there was a little more uniformity. Yeah. So I want to tell you a couple of stories. Please. Uh, you, you obviously know your stuff when it comes to elections. You probably know the answers, but I'm going to solicit them from you anyway. So let's imagine a scenario where uh, I voted by mail early, three weeks before an election, and then unfortunately I was run over by a bus mm -hmm. before election day. Yep. So my ballot was mailed in. I died before election day. Does my vote count or does my vote not count? It does count. It depends on where you live. But it depends on where you live. Correct. Right. Yes. And sometimes it depends on which county you live in within right. a specific state. For now, when we talk about it, election, mostly counts is what when, I would say. When you say. talk about election integrity, right? When I talk about it, I'm talking about this scenario where there's inconsistencies. Mm -hmm. You get a lot of conservatives talking about election integrity, which is just thinly disguised election denialism, and that's not what I'm talking about. And that's not what election integrity really is. How can it be that 15 states allow the votes? Roughly 15 states disallow those votes, and the other states don't have a law about it at all, right. right? Inconsistency is the enemy of integrity. And here, we have a very different experience for, granted, a dead voter, but it's a very different experience depending on where you live. Our election shouldn't be done that way. It should be the same experience across the board. I don't particularly care if it's thrown out or kept. In some ways, it's easier to keep it because it is very difficult and expensive to determine that someone is deceased. Right. So given that, I think we should really allow the, the votes to count. I have a grand crop compromise if anybody from Congress is watching. 
I think that part of what we should be doing is we should also put a reasonable limit on the early voting windows, which is giving conservatives something, giving liberals something here, count the votes, make the window 14 days, which is a reasonable chunk of time Mm -hmm. in which to, to, to cast your vote and package that and pass it and standardize this across the country. I have a, another quick one, if it's yeah, okay. Sure, please. So I acquire voter data from as many states as will allow me to acquire it, and that, that's one of the things I do professionally. Many states, Florida, Pennsylvania, New York State, California, give you the data for free or for a nominal amount of money. Right. What would you guess is the state that charges the most, and how much do they charge? I read the book, Alabama, $37,000. Thank you for reading the book. <laughs> There, there are not a lot of interviewers who get that far into it. I really appreciate you for that. Yes, $37,000 for Alabama's data. It's outrageous. And this happens because there is no standardization, uh, federal standardization, for what states should do for making this data available. And remember, every single state takes gobs of federal money to build their voting system. So it's legitimate for Congress to have some expectations about how things get run. By the way, you can't even get Massachusetts's voter roll. Uh, they have a state law that makes the, that data private. Uh, even though it, the, the, it says, the law says, the Secretary of State can so choose to give it to somebody if they want to. I asked and I was told, well, we can't give it to you, but you can feel free to go to every single Massachusetts municipality, all 350 of them to get the data. Is voter ID a good remedy or solution or intervention? I think it is, and, the, and the, the quiet secret is a lot of Democrats agree at this point that voter ID is, is a reasonable thing. In fact, H.R. 1, which was a failed election reform bill a couple of years ago, had voter ID baked into it as part, as part of that. A Democrat think, initiative embraced yeah, by the president. I, I think that president it is. Biden. It, it, look, it's legitimate to want to make sure you know who's voting and that who's voting is eligible to vote, by the way. I think we should have a federal voter registration, not state-based voter registration, and every voter should be registered to vote automatically on birth or naturalization. Let's just take all the voter registration problems right off the table. 45 seconds. Are you nervous about the upcoming election? I am. I don't like where the narratives are going right now, Uh, but I think President Trump has to be mindful that the election denialism is not a winning message. It is a dead, cold loser. For the general election. So... Uh, it'll be interesting to see if he moderates his message about voter fraud. In fact, if he thinks he can win, how can he continue to impugn the election that hasn't happened yet? I think there's some real challenges there. Yeah, there's a lot of, look, there's a lot of unsettled uh, people out there right now. They're still spun up about 2020. I have great fears about what happens as a result of this election. The voice of Ken Block, the book, one more time, Disproven, my unbiased search for voter fraud for the Trump campaign. The data that shows why he lost and how we can improve our elections. Ken, it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much. Thank you. Stay tuned for your takeout. Outtake Especial. We'll see you next week. I grew up playing the saxophone. I played in the jazz band in college. Uh, So I like jazz. I like uh, big band. Welcome to your takeout, Outtake Especial. You know this is the fun and games part of the program. Ken Block is our special guest. Not every data analyst is a fun and games person by nature, but I'm sure, based on my interaction with Ken so far, we will have plenty of fun here in the fun and games segment. So, Ken, we have three questions we ask all of our guests. Take them in whichever order you prefer. Most influential book in your life and why. All-time favorite movie or one of your favorite movies. One way to think about that is if you're scrolling through anything and you see that movie, you always stop. Yep. And if you're on a long flight or a long drive and you're really going to enjoy some music, what artist or genre is that most likely uh, to be? Well, let's start with a movie. Okay. Uh, I was a usher in a movie theater back in the day. Excellent. And I was, that was the summer of E.T. Okay. And uh, I could, to this day, I can tell you where in the movie the, the film is just based on the soundtrack. So <laughs> right, I, it's that embedded. So, so it's that embedded. It is a huge part of my uh, my adolescence, and so I, I'm just going to go going to go with that one. That mm-hmm. one's that one's kind of a no brainer. Boy, you know, from a book. For me, one, uh, one of the lo- the lovely parts of that movie is my middle name is Elliot. Ah, nice. Elliot. Elliot. That's yeah, always yeah, a great yeah, part yeah, of that movie. Yeah. So anyway, carry on. Please. All right. Um, Boy, the book, that, that is an interesting. I'm an eclectic reader. I, I really read across a, a broad range of genres. 
Uh, I can honestly say, you know, I don't really go back and reread books. Um, the handful that I did, but it's been years since I did it, you know, the Tom Clancy books were a draw mm -hmm. for me, uh, again, back in the day. And right. uh, I'd say, you know, in my recent adult life in the last 10 years or so, I'm not uh, I'm not reading for pleasure much anymore. So, but but, uh, but, but Tom Clancy is one of those authors in which you have a, a spy or a suspense narrative, yeah. but you also have a ton of facts and data and analytical research, yeah. which strikes me as up your alley. Yeah, it's, it's guilty. <laughs> right? Guilty, guilty. And uh, music. Yeah, music. So Again, fairly eclectic. Uh, I grew up playing the saxophone. I played in the jazz band in college. Uh, so I like jazz. Mm -hmm. I like uh, big band. I grew up with classic rock. You know, so mm -hmm. I'm kind of a, a, a kind of a weird mix when it comes to all of that. And I love funk. Mm -hmm. So okay. it's give me a classic rock station. I'll listen to it. Give me some jazz. I'll listen to it. It really depends on the mood and whether I'm trying to stay awake or not. So would uh, Coltrane <laughs> figure prominently Coltrane, in, in your love, heroes? Love Coltrane. Love. Uh, not always easy to yeah. listen to, folks. I, I tell you this all the time. Coltrane's one of my favorite jazz performers, but you have to be in certain moods for certain aspects of Coltrane. I had the great it will privilege sound of, to some ears harsh. I had the great privilege of playing with Dizzy Gillespie. You did? Yes. No way. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was great. Great. Wow. Yeah. Where was that? Tell me that. On campus. Uh, uh, the, he came to campus and we played. The band played with him. <laughs> Phenomenal. Phenomenal. And did you get a chance to riff or improvisation? Did yeah. you, did oh, yeah. you, you did just jump in and Yeah, yeah. They, they, roll? You know, depending on the song and right? what it was. Yeah, so it was. And uh, Dizzy would yield? Uh, I can't say that we really <laughs> talked all that much, no, honestly. Maybe like, but, we'll let others play. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So it was. It was great. I, I, we toured all over the world. It, it was really, it was great fun. So, yeah. That's, that's a long answer for what I like to listen to. Here's a lobster bibs. Oh, okay. So we, okay. Didn't, we didn't get a chance to really wear these, but <laughs> these are genuine Rhode Island lobster bibs. And I brought them just in case, because my wife's really nervous that, yeah, you know, I was right. going to spill on myself. Right, exactly. So, but, okay. you know, here so, you go. That is, a, that is a first time on the takeout. Oh, I was so nearly, worried somebody had done in this. In nearly eight years. Folks. Perfect. The Rhode Island lobster bib. Uh... <laughs> You saw it here. We'll see you next week.